All right, he's giving us a thumbs up. So we're going to get started here in just a minute. We got Mr. Adam back there. They placed membership with us a couple weeks ago, and he is a song leader, and we're going to let him lead us in, a, in our first two songs before I get back up here, okay? Good evening. Good evening. Well, 608, I hope everybody knows it. 608, we'll sing first. He took my burdens all away up to a brighter day. He gave me a song, a wonderful song, a wonderful song I now can sing. In my heart joy bells ring. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me from sin and doubt. Oh, praise his name, he is my king, a wonderful song, he is to me, brighter the way grows every day, I'm walking that heavenly way, he gave me a song, a wonderful song, a wonderful song I now can sing. Praises to him, my king. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me from sin and doubt. Oh, praise his name. He is my king, a wonderful song. He is to me, I am redeemed no more to die, never to say goodbye. He gave me a song, a wonderful song, and some of these days in that fair land, gonna sing with the chorus grin. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me from sin and doubt. Oh, praise his name. He is my king. A wonderful song he is to me. Amen. 18 will be our next song. Number 18, Faithful Love. Faithful love flowing down from the thorn-covered crown Makes me whole, saves my soul, washes whiter than snow Faithful love calms each fear, reaches down, dries each tear Holds my hand when I can stand on my own Faithful love from above Came to earth to show the Father's love And I'll never be the same For I've seen faithful love face to face and Jesus is his name. Faithful love is a friend. Just when hope seems to win, welcome face, sweet embrace, tender touch filled with grace. Faithful love, endless power, living flame, spirit's fire, burning bright in the night, guiding my way. Faithful love from above came to earth to show the Father's love. And I'll never be the 
same. For I've seen faithful love face to face, and Jesus is his name. All right, thank you, Adam. Before we have our classes tonight, we'll do our regular uh, announcements here. Lawrence Galloway is recovering at home from surgery to repair a broken hip. Mackenzie of El Real needs our prayers as she's had several kidney stones and they cannot be uh, corrected by surgery. Vicki Smith continues to need our prayers as she begins chemo. And David Bart is in St. Francis in Wichita and I can't read in the writing. Is this your writing? What, what did you say? <laughs> so he's uh, doing really well. Okay, not doing well at all, evidently. Huh? Okay, sorry, it was so little I couldn't read it. It's a lot better than Jimmy Rayzo. <laughs> okay. Wednesday morning Bible classes will not meet this coming Wednesday because of uh, Thanksgiving. Next Tuesday evening, everyone will be in here for our devotion. We won't have Wednesday night services. We'll have it on Tuesday night like we do every year on Tuesday. So don't come on Wednesday. Come on Tuesday if you would. Uh, the annual ladies ornament exchange is November the 30th, 6 o'clock or 6.30 p.m. In the fellowship hall, bring a snack or a finger food to share and, and wrapped ornament to exchange. I believe that's on a Thursday night if I looked it up right. Each year, Eastwood provides gifts and a pizza party for around 20 kids at Reno County youth services to help provide for these children please give your cash or check made out to eastwood to the church office or melody runyon or to perry and kathy nolan so those are our announcements for this evening and so before i go to have a little devo for you let's go to our father in prayer father we thank you for being our god for calling us your children we thank you that we can come together in the middle of the week like this and enjoy one another's fellowship and enjoy opening your book one more time and seeing what it has to say to us. We thank you for each and every one here this evening. We pray that you would help us to be a family the way you intended us to be, help us to care for one another, pray for one another, and enjoy one another's company. We thank you for loving us. We look forward to the uh, heaven at some point in time when we can come to be with you and your son and the rest of the people listed in this Bible. We thank you, Father, for just the opportunity we have to have that hope that you've told us about. Help us to hold on to it. Help us to be encouraged because of it. Help us to remember that it's there waiting on us. All we have to do is follow your son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you want to be turning to John chapter 8, I'm going to read a couple of scriptures out of there in just a moment. About a month ago, me and Adam, the guy that just led singing, and my grandson went to a Chiefs game at Arrowhead. On the way home, I noticed we needed a tank of gas before we, or we wouldn't gonna make it home, right? So we're not too familiar with the territory. And I pull off the side road after about 20 miles out of Kansas City, and I come to the, uh, a road, a paved road, a highway, looking left and looking right, I'm trying to figure out, we need to find a gas station because I haven't seen one yet. And there's a gas station clear over there, maybe a block, two blocks to my right, but the problem is I'm in the left-hand lane. I look to the left, I look to the right, I don't see a soul. I turn right and went to the gas station. And all of a sudden, it's Christmas in my rear rear mirror. <laughs> yeah. And so he pulls us over, I pull over. Adam's getting my proper paperwork out of the glove box for me. The policeman comes over and, he, and we show it to him and he starts, he says, uh, did you go to the ball game tonight? I said, yeah, we're from Reno County, Hutchinson. He says, yeah, we get this a lot at this intersection. We, we've had, a lot of people injured here at this intersection, so therefore, we put this together like this. He says, but then he kind of smiled and he says, just enjoy, just enjoy your ride home and be careful. He did not give me a ticket. He did not give me a ticket and I'm going, that's good. I deserved a ticket, but I didn't get a ticket. Adam's over there laughing his head off, but anyway. <laughs> so anyway, I want to go to John 8 because I'm thinking, you know what? Jesus does not always give us what we deserve but he pardons us and he forgives us and he gives us grace and he gives us mercy 
And that's what he did to this lady here in John 8. I know you know the story about the adulterous woman, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. But I want to go down in verse 10. After, the, after, the fair, after these people have come, they've accused her of uh, adultery. And Jesus has asked him to go, you know, whoever has no sin, let them throw the first stone. And according to the, according to the law, whoever is accusing these people is supposed to throw the first stone. Well, they start leaving from oldest to the youngest. That tells you something, right? Verse 10, and straightening up, Jesus, because he had wrote some things on the ground, and straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way from now on and sin no more. And I'm thinking, I think she thought like I did when I left that policeman. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a far cry from... from from what she did and what I did, but what I'm saying is that made me think of something like this, you know, you know, I deserved a ticket, but I didn't get it. He let me off. This lady deserved punishment. She did not get it, and Jesus let her off. And I'm thinking, we don't know anything more about this lady after we read the story, but you can just imagine how she felt and what she may have done from that point on. I don't know what she did, but I'm thinking she'll always remember that Jesus did that for her and that she was pardoned. And that's my thought for tonight. None of us are sinless. We all fall short of the glory of God, according to what Paul said in Romans, right? We know we're going to do that. So we need to have a little bit of lenience. We need to have a little bit of mercy and pardon in our life toward other people when they do things to us or say things to us. We need to have a little forgiveness in our heart toward them, okay? You may go to your classes. Thank you, Mr. Steve. Thank you, Adam, for leading and singing here tonight. One thing about riding with Steve, it will really increase your prayer life. That's uh, one thing I've discovered over the years. Uh, we want to welcome all those that are watching online as well. And if uh, Sue Hill is watching here tonight, we have your earring. Uh, she lost one over there at the fall festival. So it has been found. So we will leave that in the office uh, for you here. Glad that you're here tonight. We are missing a bunch of folks here. You know, I know there's a lot of people traveling this time of the year. There's a quite a bit of sickness going around. So uh, we're so thankful for everybody that's been able to be here tonight that's watching online. But we are missing a bunch of folks, but uh, we look forward to having them back just as soon as possible. And uh, what time are services next week? It's always good to review things. What time are services next week? We're getting together on Tuesday. What time? Seven o'clock, and let's just jam pack this place. We'll have all the kids uh, join with us. I don't think they'll have their uh, Bible classes. We'll do for that. Of all the different holidays we kind of celebrate here in America, Thanksgiving obviously is the most biblical of all of those. We're giving. Oh, mercy. <laughs> Crystal, get the peanut butter and jelly ready. You know, we're feeding a bunch of folks, all right? So next Tuesday night, let's come and really give thanksgiving and praise to God. Okay, tonight we're going to be talking about why problems should encourage us. Why our problems should encourage us. We're going to be looking at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, 1 through 8. Then we're going to look at two, our three primary uh, lessons that we can get out of that. But just to show of hands, anybody had any problems in the last six months? Last six months, okay, all right, yeah, problem last six months. How about the last six weeks? The last six weeks, any last six weeks? Uh, last six days, maybe, at least one problem, okay, yeah, all right, we, we all can relate. Uh, most, or some have said that uh, we are either coming out of a problem, going into a problem, or living with a problem. How many of you are sitting next to your problem? Raise your hand. <laughs> Come on, I couldn't believe you fell with that one. The people online are even like, <laughs> Lloyd's like, hey, both sides over here, okay? <laughs> All right. Believe it or not, problems are a big part of God's plan and economy to help us grow. Hopefully we can show that to you here tonight. Uh, notice, if you will, the Patriarch Job's response in uh, Trials of Humanity. He says in Job chapter 14, verse 1 and 2, Mortals are born of flesh, are a few days full of trouble. They spring up like flowers and wither away like fleeting shadows. They do not endure. 
And so it does seem like a good portion of our life. We are coming out of a problem or working through a problem or we might just about to be stepping into one. But if we have the right kind of mindset, right kind of faith and determination, when we see these problems, we encounter these problems, don't allow it to discourage you. Remember, that's our overall theme for this Wednesday night class is overcoming discouragement. Use this problem. Have the right mindset towards it and allow it to help you to grow and mature. And hopefully we can kind of see that here tonight. Here's what we're going to do. So put problems right in the middle. And we'll see from the passages we look at here tonight, three important lessons that we can gain from our problems and our trials. Okay? First of all, problems will accelerate our spiritual growth. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And let's look at verses 1 through 3. It will enhance our spiritual growth. Let's look at that. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and God's fellow worker in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials, and you know quite well that we were destined for them. Now, in the modern age that we're in, where we have got our cell phones, and we've got Zoom, and uh, we can do team meetings, and do you remember Dick Tracy back in the day? that cartoon Dick Tracy. And wasn't that the coolest thing of him maybe having a watch that he could talk to somebody on to see their face? We are living through that time. Maybe we live long enough, maybe we'll be like the Jetsons. I've been seeing some of these flying cars that they have. Who knows, in the next 25 or 30 years, maybe we'll just be flying around all over the place, okay? Now, Paul didn't have all of the uh, modern conveniences of how to communicate with folks. And so he was really concerned about how this new congregation was doing. Remember, they kind of got rushed out of town. They got persecuted out of town. And so he said, well, we couldn't stand it any longer. Uh, me and Silas or Sylvanus, we stayed here in Athens, and we sent Timothy to, con to go and check on you. Um, he was worried that Satan had somehow... Uh, hindered them and, and kind of just wrecked havoc in that congregation. You di didn't know. And so he wanted to find out. And so he sent Timothy to strengthen them and to comfort them. Now, uh, this does allow our problems to accelerate our spiritual growth. Let me tell you a little silly, a silly story maybe to illustrate this. So imagine a couple guys coming out of Chicago, and they're city boys. And they move out to uh, West Texas, let's say out around Lubbock, Texas. And, and they want to uh, buy a farm. They want to buy a cotton farm, become cotton farmers. So they move to town, and they go up into the mercantile store, and they're like, hey, uh, we're from Chicago, but we want to get into the farming business. And so what do we need to have? And the guy's like, well, you're going to need seed, you're going to need fertilizer, you're going to have to buy a, a plow, and they're like, sold, we want it, Let's, here's our money. And he said, well, you'll need to buy a mule as well to be able to move some of that stuff around. They're like, uh, okay, no problem, we'll buy a mule. And he said, well, it's going to take a little bit to get the mule over here. Yeah, no problem, we'll just wait for a little while. And as they're waiting, they're looking around the mercantile shop, and they see, uh, what do they call those watermelons, those real big ones down there in... Uh, South uh, Texas, the black diamond ones. There's a striped one that they have. I think it's the black diamond. It's one of those black diamond. He's like, what's that big green thing? And the shop owner thought he'd have a little fun. He said, that's a mule egg. <laughs> They're like, wow, they come in eggs? All right, I'll buy one. And so he had some fun. He sold it to him. Well, as their pickup pulled up, and they were loading up all their, all their things and, and stuff, and the, the mule was going to come in a little bit later, they, they're going down the road, and it's a bumpy old road out there in, in West Texas, 
And that crazy watermelon fell out and just splatted all over the highway. So they hit the brakes and they look at it. And they're like, oh, no, we broke our mule egg. And all of a sudden, you ever seen one of those West Texas jackrabbits? I mean, they're huge. Got big ears and stuff. And the, and the jackrabbit's eating on the watermelon. And they're like, look at that. The mule has hatched. And so they run out, and they're running around after that jackrabbit. Well, the jackrabbit sees them. It's just hopping all over the place. And they are absolutely exhausted. And finally, the jackrabbit takes off, and they're sitting down, and one friend says to the other, he's like, man, there's no way we're going to catch that mule. Yeah. He said, I guess we, we won't end up... Uh, farming with that one uh, and he said well no problem I didn't want to farm that fast anyway so you know sometimes <laughs> sometimes we do not grow and accelerate our spiritual growth as fast as the Lord will allow us or want us to do that we just kind of say okay I want to be a Christian but I just want to go on the slow and steady and God might be wanting to say hey we got we've got to grow we got to develop you now go with me to James chapter 1 we were talking a little bit about that uh, this past Sunday we were talking about the gift of patience look over here at James chapter 1 again James chapter 1 Verses 2 through 4. Here we read, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. All right? Has any of you ever had a considerate, all joy party whenever you're going through problems and trials and testing. I actually read about a preacher in Florida years ago that would host considerate pure joy parties. And so he'd get on the phone, and that was back when people called each other before they texted each other, and get on the phone and said, hey, I'm having a get together. Can you make it over, say, Friday night? And they're like, what, was it your birthday? No. Did you get a job promotion? No. Uh, something going on special with the family? No. Why are you doing this? Well, I'm having a considerate all joy party. I'm really going through a difficult time, a hardship right now, and I know God's going to teach me something. I'm going to learn something. I'm going to grow through this experience, so I just want to go and celebrate that. Can you come on over? He actually did that. Now, I kind of ask you, have, have you guys ever done it? You said that? No, I have not either. But one thing that we can do is we can control our thinking about this. To say, okay, I need to line up my thinking more with this biblical thought when he said, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. When we're facing these trials, it's testing our faith. It's developing what in us? It's developing patience and how fast do we want to have patience we want it now. now okay all right so if you want to have it now guess what you get to have a lot of a lot of trials that you get to go through a lot of problems that you're going to have but you're going to develop that patience and that patience will allow you to be mature and allow you to grow in that that's going to accelerate our growth now, I lived out in uh, Tucson, Arizona for uh, three and a half, four years, something like that. And outside of Tucson, Max, you might know where Oracle is, don't you? He knows where Sabino Canyon is. Very few people, uh, if you haven't uh, been out there, know about Sabino Canyon. But Oracle's just a little bit north of Tucson, maybe 20, 30 miles or so. But they developed this thing called the biosphere. And it looks like a space station kind of thing. And 25, 30 years ago when I was living out there, they were allowing these astronaut-like people to live in there for like two years. And they could not come out. And they were just studying their, their body chemistry and how living in this closed environment, you know, would impact, you know, human uh, life and all that. And so they were studying all these things. Well, in Biosphere 2, they built a second one of those. Um, the trees grew really, really fast. But as they were reaching maturity, 
guess what all those trees did? They fell over because it was such a perfectly controlled environment there wasn't strength to those trees so yeah they grew with all the sunlight and all the you know vegetation fertilization in there but there's something about that resistance of the wind that's on these trees that strengthen them make them strong so it's that struggle that they're going through that will make them strong guess what that that struggle that you and i go through that's what's making us strong. It's helping us to be more patient. It's allowing us to become more mature. And, and so uh, I didn't see Kathy Nolan was here, but uh, she quoted James when, when all of those bottles of water went falling out of the you know, chest there. You know, and I'm like, you know, that's true. But it's like, well, I've been here, done that before. No sense in losing my cool on this stuff. Maybe 20 years ago, there might have been a few bottles flying all over our fellowship hall after that. But now... Kind of learn some of this patience through some of this experience. Hopefully there's some maturity that's taking place in that. So it can enhance or it can accelerate our spiritual growth. What was that Avengers movie? Mason with the guy that they pumped him full of stuff it was during World War II? Captain America. Captain America. Yes, Captain America. And so he was this little tiny scrawny guy. It's good to have these young folks in our class. Man, they're, they're our good... And he works out at the movie theaters, too, so I knew he would be a shoe-in for this one. A little small, scrawny guy, and so they had to pump him full of these chemicals so he could grow to be six foot four and full of muscles and become Captain America. And that's what, if you have the right mindset, the trials and tribulations that you and I go through, it will help us grow. It will accelerate our spiritual growth. But that's not the only thing that they'll do. Go with me back to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. First Thessalonians chapter 3, let's read verse 3 again <clears throat> and look at a little different emphasis on the latter part of that verse. So that no one will be unsettled by these trials, that you know quite well that we were destined for them. All right, so the word unsettled or moved means to shake or to wag, literally like a dog wagging its tail. You ever been so shaken up? I mean, you're just almost rattled there. He said, I, I don't want you to be shaken up here. I don't want you wagging, wagging around like a, like a dog's tail because of all the trials that you're going through. Now, do you remember a little conversation that uh, Jesus had? Well, in fact, let's turn to it. Turn with me to uh, Luke 22. We've got plenty of time here. Luke 22, a conversation that Jesus was having with Peter. Luke 22, 32. Well, let's back up to 31, get a, get a run at it. Luke 22, verse 31. <clears throat> Simon, Simon. So talk about Simon Peter. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Wow. How do you think Peter might have felt having a conversation with that like Jesus? Satan, uh, or, uh, uh, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you. Now, we have quite a few farmers uh, in our area here, what does it mean to sift the wheat? What's going on when you're sifting wheat? Have you ever seen that before? Alan, you work for ADM or whoever it was out there for a what? What's about all this wheat and sifting it? How do you go about doing that? Uh huh. Mm hmm. Oh, really? So even, even in the modern industrial part, that as you're dumping that stuff, that light chaff will blow away from that? Okay. I bet you guys have been using this around your house a little bit, haven't you, these rakes? Wow. Does anybody need any sycamore trees? I've got four of them, you know, that... <laughs> It is my torture every fall when that stuff just starts dumping and dumping and dumping. <laughs> well, 
Well, I've been loading up Steve's truck and we dump them early. And uh, ooh, I shouldn't let that slip, but no. Um, think about how they would harvest the wheat back in those Bible days, and they would take it over, and they would have, you know, as they were kind of grinding up, like with a with a uh, what a donkey or maybe an ox or something like that. And they'd have them walk around. They had the big stone on there, and they'd kind of crunch it all up and break up the, the heads of grain, which are heavier than the chaff. And then they get a fan, and then they kind of fling it up in the air. And then, like they said, the wind blows it away. And then eventually, it's just you know the the pure wheat that's uh, down in the pile there. Okay. Yeah, threshing machines. Yeah, used to do those kinds of things like that as well. So imagine that happening to a person to say Satan wants to crunch you up and let you blow away but Jesus said I've been doing something for you here it's very very important in spiritual warfare what it what it what was uh, Jesus doing for Simon Peter uh, I'm praying for you I'm praying for you so that uh, your faith may not fail and then when you come back and I want you to strengthen up your brothers uh, is uh, Peter going to have a crisis of faith shortly after this conversation? Well, yeah, he will. Remember Jesus' trial, and, and he denied knowing Jesus uh, three different times there. He had a failure of faith. Jesus said, I am praying for you. That was a time that Satan was really sifting him, really testing out. Do you really believe? Are you committed? Do you really want to follow after Jesus? And he had some lacks in that faith. But he bounced back, and then the Lord was able to restore him because he was, he was praying for him. Um, when we go through these trials, these sifting experiences, it allows us to see where our faith is. Is it real? Go with me to the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. It's interesting that Peter talks about this. First Peter chapter 1, and I'd like to read verse 6 and 7 to you. First Peter 1, 6 and 7. Oh, hold on, let me just write up here, evaluate your faith. So will enhance your spiritual growth, it will also evaluate your faith. Look at verse 6 and 7. Here we read, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. And these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Um, before I took chemistry classes in, in high school, I really had a, a desire to become a geologist. My grandfather was a gold and silver miner. And so I had read books when I was real little about all these different gems and gold and silver and, and uh, you know, learned all the little charts on all that stuff. And then I'm like, oh, man, how much chemistry do you have to take to be a geologist? And it was you know, six or nine hours every semester. I said, nuts to that. I'll just be a rock hound like Alan over here. We'll just admire them from afar, won't we? But uh, I did learn a lot about uh, gold and silver mining and, and how you go about processing that stuff. And, and it comes in ore formations. Uh, Crystal and I were up in uh, Cripple Creek, Colorado. It's one of the largest gold mines in the world. Um, and they show you this ore and they give you a rock. Um, but they have to, you know, smash, you know, like a million pounds of that stuff, you know, just to get like one pound of gold. They make about a million dollars a day as they crush and they smelt that ore. But that's pretty good in a year's time, right? $365 million that they make, uh, the gold that they pull out of those kinds of things. Well, you've got to have those really hot furnaces to be able to burn off all that slag to get down to the, the, the pure ore. Like I said, my uh, grandfather was a gold and silver uh, miner, and he collected a few things uh, that he passed on to me. Uh, there was a gold nugget, and there was like a coin, but it was, it was square in shape. 
And I thought, well, let me just go get that appraised sometime to see how much that might be worth. And so I showed it to the jeweler that appraised it. He's looking at it. He said, you know, if this is real, this was like 25, 30 years ago, he said, that'd be worth like $50,000. And I'm like, boy, this is going to be great. But he gets his file out, files on that little coin, and he gets his little acid, and it was gold-plated, but it was just like lead on the inside of that. I'm like, Grandpa, what in the world are you buying this fake coin like this for? Because obviously he wouldn't have been able to afford a coin like that. But it tested it and found out that it wasn't real. So when we talk about faith, we're in our Bible classes and our worship services and maybe our home devotionals and maybe small groups or something, we're talking about, man, I got faith, I'm going to be strong, I'm going to not give in to temptation, I'm just going to be, you know, an on-fire disciple for Jesus, and all of a sudden here comes the problem, here comes the trial, and the things that we say in here may not always be practiced out there. Anybody ever experienced that before? needs to be practiced out there, whatever we say in here. It needs to be just as consistent outside. But what that does for you, it allows you to evaluate where your faith is. And so it doesn't have to be a failure. It, it, it just, it's revealing data. It's giving information to you to say, okay, maybe I'm not as strong as I you know, make myself cracked up to be. I've got to get in here. I've got to study some more. I need to pray some more. I need to serve some more. I need to be asking for God to pour his grace into my life and trust in the work of the Holy Spirit so that I can take this stuff that I've been learning here. And in Bible classes, we're talking about, okay, when I go through these troubles, it's going to help me to grow. It's going to let me know where my faith really is. I might be giving myself an evaluation of a seven or eight, but in reality, it's only a one or two. And so that doesn't have to be a failure, but that's, uh, that's giving me feedback. That's the word I'm looking for, giving me feedback that I need, there's opportunity for me to grow here. Now, go back with uh, me to uh, 1 Thessalonians 3. It's interesting, as, as Paul was talking, these guys were new Christians. This was a, a young church. It's not like they'd been around 20 or 30 years. Um, but he points out to them, that, uh, you know, when I was talking to you about these trials, he says, um, you know, you know quite well that we were, here's the word, destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted, and it turned out that way, as you well know. Now, a lot of this health and wealth gospel that you hear that a lot of folks are buying into that seems to be real popular, they don't preach messages like this. Where Paul was saying, you know, while we were with you, we told you this over and over again. We're going to be persecuted. In fact, these trials, these hardships that you're going through, you are destined. This is part of your Christian destiny is to experience them. And isn't that what Jesus talked about? Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He said that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 through 12. Um, Paul would write, everyone who wants to live a godly life will be persecuted, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. Um, and we just read over here in James, consider pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Or King James, I like that one where it says, where you fall into diverse temptation or manifold temptations. Have you ever just been walking around and all of a sudden you just slipped and fall? Phew. I mean, you were just walking. You weren't looking to, you know, step in a hole. But, I mean, you just slipped and fell. When I had, uh, really it was Daisy's dog, but he kind of adopted me, and so I'd have to take little Jackson out for a walk all the time. Uh, he was our little Yorkshire ter Terrier, probably the best dog I've ever, ever had. Great, great little dog. So we would go walking early in the morning, and uh, we live over here on 21st Avenue, so we'd walk by the water plant and uh, go down to the playground there where they have the tennis courts and all that stuff over there by the state fair. And so one uh, morning I was walking back, it's the middle of the summer, uh, sprinklers hadn't gone off, it was still really dark, and I noticed that it kind of puddles up over on the, uh, on the sidewalk there. Uh, but it didn't look very deep, and I had my tennis shoes on, and I said, man, Jackson, I'll let you walk over here on the grass, and I'll just kind of walk, 
you know, on the concrete part. So I'm just walking, all of a sudden, whoo, bam, landed around my back and on my head. Um, and I looked around for a second. I was like, whoa, everything's blurry. I'm like, man, I think I might have hit my head really bad. But then it dawned on me, I was like, oh, my glasses aren't on. Okay, so here, <laughs> whoo. But it had this little mud sheen that had come, you know, when, when, you know, water puddles and gets on, you know, concrete, just had a real slick algae deal. And, uh, and so I just slid, got my glasses back on and uh, kicked Jackson a time or two for not warning me about that. And I'm like, come on, what kind of dog are you here? But, you know, I wasn't looking to fall. It just, it just happened. Kind of experienced that. And, and I think these trials in life that we go through, they just kind of come up on us out of nowhere. And I, I think Satan's working on a lot of that stuff behind the scenes and, and studying us and looking at us to find where our strength and our weaknesses are. And then we'll set the perfect snare for us when we're kind of confident and going through life. Seem like, man, my faith is doing good and great things are going on. And all of a sudden he just kind of whew, pulls that out from under us um, and shakes us up. And so he was worried that, man, maybe my, my, our efforts may have been in vain. We worked real hard on you, but maybe we just wasted our time because Satan has just sifted you and, and gone through, and, and we don't have, have any idea. Um, I want you to think about, you know, as, as we think about enhancing or accelerating our spiritual growth or evaluating our faith of what God is, is, is allowing us to experience and what that's going to do for us. Um, you ever had a kid that stepped on a goat head or got a thorn in their foot and they ask you for some help and you're like oh yeah sure and then when you go to try to help them out they're like oh don't touch that and you're like well you asked for my help you know how am I going to get that out of there yeah but it's going to hurt I know but if you let me get the goat head out or pull the splinter out you'll feel a lot better you know I wonder do we do that with God sometimes and we're going through these painful things, and we're like, God, I need your help, I need your help. And when he's al trying to allow us to grow and trying to give us feedback of where our faith is, we're like, no, 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 no. You know, don't, don't pull that out. Don't let me experience that. Or it's like, you know, a surgeon that's working on you, and it's trying to get your gallbladder all taken care of and get you healthy, and you're like waking up, uh, yeah, could you please sew that up real fast? This is hurting way too much. I didn't know. I wasn't signing up for all of that, no. Now, and, and that's what we kind of do with God in some of these things. So a lot of times these painful things that we're going through, we'll look at it with the right lens that it's something healthy for us. God is doing some amazing things in our life to help us to look more like Jesus. Now let's go back over here and look at uh, verses 6 through 8 of how it can help us cultivate our relationships with the body of Christ. Look at verses uh, 6 through 8 here. He said, but now Timothy has just now come to us from you, and he's brought good news about your faith and love. He's told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us, just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers, in all of our distress and persecutions, we're encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. Wow. So they, they got word back. Timothy made it back. They, they had sent him up there when they were in Athens, but by that time they'd gone all the way down to Corinth. So he made it back to Corinth. He said, man, I've got good news. These Christians up in Thessalonica, they are standing strong. And they're saying good things about you, and they're standing firm. And so Paul's like, man, now we really live. What a great report. So what these problems, these trials can do, it can actually cultivate... Um, our relationships, you got to be able to stand on your head to read this stuff, you know, in the body of Christ. In the church. What does it mean to cultivate something? Again, you, a lot of you guys are farmers. You're like, we got to go cultivate the fields. Get rid of the weeds. Yeah, loosen up the ground there. Get it prepared. Get it ready. Um, and it really, these things that we go through really evaluate and interact with our, our, our relationships with one another in, in the body of Christ. 
One, and let me give you three of these of how that will impact in three ways here. Let me spin this around. This is such a handy deal. I'm so glad that. Steve, it's so nice, I might even let you borrow it every now and then, okay? <laughs> oh. All right. What do we say about our leaders in the church here? Um, look at verse uh, chapter five, verse twelve, and verse seventeen. Chapter five, verse uh, twelve and seventeen. <clears throat> now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. That's the NIV. Does somebody have a different version for verse 12? 1 Thessalonians 5, 12. Brothers, uh, to what? Those that work hard among you. Everybody use respect? Acknowledge. Respect. Uh, speak well of these people that are in a leadership position that are over you in the Lord. Look at verse 17. Excellent. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for worthy of double honor there. Um, that's pray continually. That's, that's another good one there. But um, let me go back to uh, 3.6a there where he says, when Timothy has come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love, he told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we also long to see you. Leaders tend to have a lot of folks say negative things about them. Um, one is part of the reason that somebody's in a leadership position is to kind of institute change. Okay? Well, we need to be changing, we need to be growing. People don't like change. And so whoever this person is kind of making us feel uncomfortable because I don't like that change, well, I might like them outside of that role, but because of that role that they're in, um, I, I'm going to take out my criticism and negativity on them. And so God's people need to always be mindful you know, to do what we can. You know, if they're doing something wrong or teaching, yeah, that, that's a time to criticize or, or whatever if they're disobeying God. But I mean, if they're, they're trying to do what's right, trying to teach the Word of God, they're trying to help us to grow in our, in our fellowship with one another and our relationship with God, to be serving, to evangelizing, to, to develop our talents and, and, and to learn how to do those things, that, that takes some effort. We've got to apply ourselves. And sometimes you've got to kind of encourage and nudge people along and they're they're kind of taking baby steps and you're like hey we need to get you out here and get you doing some of these things and and so sometimes there's some resistance there but a sign uh that you are in a healthy state spiritually is that you aren't criticizing your leaders unduly or unjustly that we're respecting them and that we listen to them we obey them uh, we, we're encouraging them uh, so, remember how I've been kind of giving out little challenges weekly to do different things? Maybe think about what could I do to maybe encourage or uplift, you know, some of our, our leaders, you know, our elders, our, our deacons, uh, our Bible class teachers, those that are uh, kind of leaders in different ministries and, and things like that. Um, leadership's tough. That's not the easiest thing to do. Uh, and. And uh, you know, I was part of a class recently uh, that, you know, the vast majority of people that are managers and supervisors have never had one day of instruction how to be a manager and supervisor. Maybe they were out of this world engineer. They did really well. They said, hey, you're our top engineer. We're going to make you a manager of the engineers. And he's never been through any business organization or anything like that to teach. How do you manage? How do you supervise? How do you uplift and build and encourage? And, train people to take your job and all that, they've never been taught. And so they've got poor skills, now they're making everybody else feel miserable here. And so think about in, you know, in the church setting, what are we doing to encourage our leaders? That's a sign of my spiritual uh, makeup, but where I'm at, kind of evaluating our faith is, how am I talking about you know, the leaders and how am I encouraging them in the work that God's called them to do, okay? Secondly, do we have a desire to 
to be with other Christians. All right, what are we saying about our leaders? And two, do we have a desire to be with other Christians? Again, verse 6. But Timothy has just now come to us from you, and he's brought good news about your faith and love. He's told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us, just as we also long to see you. Wow, maybe that's a question to ask. Do we long to see our brothers and sisters in Christ? Do we long to be with one another in our fellowship activities, in our worship services, in our, our Bible classes, or do we look at opportunities to see how far we can get away from them? Uh, because a lot of things maybe we've experienced the last few years, it's easy to get in habits and, and ruts and, and say, well, maybe, you know, getting together isn't as a priority as it should be. Well, what does the scripture say about us longing to be together, if at all possible? That's a sign of where we are in, in our faith and how healthy we are. We're longing for those opportunities. Man, that's a good mark. They really, really long to be together. Now let's look at a third one. Um, our faith needs to invigorate others. All right, our faith invigorates others, okay? Verse 7, therefore, brothers, in all of our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. He said that they were encouraged. When we heard about your faith, when Timothy started describing the kind of faith that you guys had, even in the midst of persecution, that encouraged us. That inspired us. Let's look at a couple of verses here. We've got about 10 minutes. Go with me to Romans chapter 1, and then we're going to go to 1 Corinthians. Romans chapter 1. This is what Paul had to say about the Christians there in Rome. <clears throat> Let me uh, read to you verse 11 and 12. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Wow. He's like, I'm longing to see you guys. I, I'm going to give you guys a spiritual gift. And here, let me explain that. We're going we're gonna to be encouraged by each other's faith. You ever been inspired by somebody else's faith? You ever been inspired by somebody else's faith, their conviction, their devotion to God? I remember my, my great-grandmother inspired me uh, one day. She lived to be... 93, 93, I believe. So I had a good long life. And we just lived less, less than a half a block uh, from the church building there in Wilcox, Arizona. I remember she was probably in her 90s. Yeah, she was still living at home. Um, and one day she was coming back. And again, this is Arizona. We would get hot, you know, well over 100 degrees all the time during the summertime. And I remember it was either after a Sunday morning service or a Sunday night service. And oftentimes, you know, it's really hot before the sun starts going down um, there. And, and so she was walking back from the church building. I know she tottered to the right, tottered over to the left, tottered to the right, uh, because I wasn't in a place I could get to her and run up to her and, and, um, and grab her arm. But I was like, man, I want to have that kind of devotion. You know, when I'm that age in life. To say, I know you don't feel good. I know it's tough for you to make that walk. And man, it sure would have been easy to stay. And we had a nice air-conditioned house, just literally less than a half a block away uh, from the church building. But that woman of God had faith to say, I'm going to be with my brothers and sisters. That was a high point for her. Sunday morning Bible class. Sunday morning services, Sunday night services, Wednesday night services. 
uh, spring gospel meeting, fall gospel meeting, and singing uh, class during the summertime. I mean, she would, if, there, if at all possible, she was going to be there. That inspired me as a young person to see that kind of faith. And so as we're interacting with one another, seeing each other, that's why we need as many people as we can to, to, to be together and watching online. That we, ought to, we ought to inspire each other, encourage each other's faith. Let's go over here to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26. Here's, here's how connected we ought to be to one another. He describes the church as being a body. Eyes and ears. Now look at this in, in verse number 26. <clears throat> if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, Every part rejoices with it. So think about your body. When something kind of gets out of whack, Carol, I'm going to pick on you for just a second because we can relate. We've been down the same path in the last year or two. Uh, I think you broke a pinky toe recently, didn't you? Whew! Oh, that even makes me shiver a little more. It says you broke three little toes recently. Um, did the... Uh, <laughs> Somebody else did over here too? No, you scared me. I thought you were talking about me. Oh, but I broke my pinky toe about a year ago and, and stuff that I stubbed it on something. Did your body react or did the, the pain just stay with those three little toes? Yeah, the entire body was impacted by that, wasn't it? Okay. Now, make the same parallel to the body of Christ. When we have folks that are suffering, and uh, let's be especially mindful of uh, Brother um, uh, Dave Bartlett, that uh, Judy called me just right before services, and I could tell she was very concerned. His O2 levels are going way down. His blood pressure is way down. And so he could be very well facing end-of-life issues. And so that ought to touch us. That ought to touch our hearts to be thinking about, hey, that's somebody in the body of Christ, and to lose them, that's a great loss, and to see somebody suffering, that, that we, we suffer with them. And on the other hand, when things are going well, that we see promotions, we see graduations, we see uh, marriages, uh, we see uh, folks having kiddos and, and things like that, having successful uh, ministry events like the Fall Festival, man, we rejoice, we celebrate, because we're interacting and we're encouraging each other's faith. Now, the key to all of this, it looks like we just have two or three minutes, is don't let these problems that we're going to face get you down and get you discouraged. Instead, I want you to think about three things. That how am I going to grow from this thing? How is it going to evaluate my faith and see where I'm at? And how is that cultivating my relationships with others in the body of Christ? Thinking of how am I thinking about our, our leaders and how, how am I interacting with others and how am I being inspired, you know, with, with the, the faith that other people have. And, and my word is going to be stay with it. Keep at it. Probably all of us learned how to ride a bike, you know, sometime in our life. But did you start riding immediately? Or did you have a few bumps and falls, you know, along the way? There was a couple of kids. There's a, a mom that lives here in the neighborhood, and she brings her kids over and lets them ride their bikes, and they play over at our little uh, sand pit and, and stuff like that. And uh, it was funny. The, the, the daughter's a little bit older than the brother, maybe a year or two older. She still had training wheels on. He was like evil Knievel riding his little old thing around here. You know, his feet could barely touch, but he was just flying all over the place. And, uh, but I mentioned he's wrecked a time or two, but he stayed with it. And now he's successful. And she's staying with hers, and now she can pedal all around. And, and so when you're thinking about these trials, and you're like, man, I didn't handle that too. Hey, keep on pedaling. Stay with it. We're looking for growth. It's amazing, little by little on things over a period of time, of how much that you can grow. Okay? Let's close this out with a word of prayer here tonight. Father, we do thank you. Uh, help us, help us, help us, Father. When we face these trials, these challenges, these difficulties, these accidents that we have periodically, and it's just so easy to get discouraged and get down and get depressed. Uh, Father, help us to have faith. Help us to, 
to grow, help us to mature and be patient. And, and I pray for our, our church. I'm praying for growth. I'm praying for uh, new people you allow us to serve and to reach out to and, and help people to fold into and integrate into our, our church family. We just want to worship you and praise you and, and to serve you and, and to take the love and devotion that we have for you and to share it with everybody uh, that we come into contact with. Uh, Father, we had a long list that uh, Steve mentioned here that's in need of our prayers, but we're especially prayerful for, for Dave Bartlett. Uh, Father, we just ask for your grace and mercy to be upon him, especially uh, be with uh, Judy and comfort her and help us to be a, a body that, that truly is, is supportive of her during a very challenging time as well. Thank you for everybody that's been able to be here tonight and to join us online and ask for your blessing to be upon each and every one of us. In Jesus we pray, amen. All right, thanks for being here tonight and look forward to seeing you in a few days.